And it's Friday, and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of History Lunch Break. My name is Glenn Perkins from the Greensboro History Museum. Um, excited to be having a special Women's History Month History Lunch Break episode today with my special, special guest, Dr. Lee Williams, uh, author and uh, biographer of uh, civil rights leader Ella Baker. Welcome, Lee. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, it's always a pleasure to have you on, uh, you know, for you to share your stories and your research and what you've been working on. And now you and I, we, we, I think we should just like dive right in because we were talking when we started about, you know, how do we talk about Ella Baker? Because she did so much over so long. And again, that's and has taken us another, you know, what you said, six decades to kind of recognize her view. But we, we thought maybe we'd start with one moment of time in Ella's life, uh, April 1960. Um, so tell us a little bit about where she was then and what drew her to start organizing students together at Shaw University okay. at that time. Well, in order to talk about April of 1960, let me go back a few months to February 1 of 1960 because that's where the story started in terms of Ella Baker and what would become SNCC. And that of course is the date that the four students left the campus of North Carolina A&T, walked downtown to the Woolworths, purchased a few products and then went and sat at the lunch counter and asked very politely to be served coffee. Well, things quickly moved after that. I mean, it's amazing that in the days without social media. The telephone worked very well. So people were on the telephone talking about what had happened on February 1st. And one of the people contacted was Ella Baker, who at that time was working at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which uh, was King's, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's organization that had been founded after the uh, Montgomery bus boycott. And um, folks had gotten on the phone and told her about what was going on. In fact, Fred Shuttlesworth, who uh, was a prominent minister in Birmingham, happened to be in um, High Point about uh, oh, two days after February 1. And there were some students who were at a church organizing and getting ready to go to downtown High Point to sit in. And so he got in touch with Ella Baker and this is what he said. He said, you must tell Martin that we must get with this. And then he added about the sit-ins. He said the sit-ins might shake up the world. And indeed they did. So Ella Baker knew about the sit-ins quite early on. And she decided uh, that she would bring the student leaders together. Now these sit-ins, the one that started here in Greensboro on February 1st, quite quickly spread to Durham, to Raleigh, to High Point, jumped across the state line to uh, South Carolina and then spread all over the South. And it happened very quickly. So, um, in mid-April, which was about, uh, oh, what, maybe uh, eight, 10 months late, 10 weeks later, uh, she was convening a conference on the campus of her alma mater, Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. She had gotten uh, uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to contribute $800 toward that conference. She got Dr. King to agree to sign a letter to the student leaders, inviting them to the conference. And she got him to agree to give a keynote address. So all of that happened in a very short time. And from that time on, Ella Baker was the person who mentored and guided the students, uh, guided them to organizing their own uh, organization, SNCC, and um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, known as SNCC for short. And uh, they did that around October of the same year. She gave them some space at uh, SCLC in Atlanta, where she was working. 
and they came together and uh, had a third meeting there at the SCLC headquarters. And that's when they decided we're going to incorporate our own organization. And she was the guiding force uh, in terms of helping the students think through all of that from that time on. You mentioned um, uh, Shuttleworth's observation and his words to King. Um, was there like, was there sort of an overall recognition that these, that these students uh, and their organizing efforts were going to become a critical part of the civil rights movement? Or was that something that really Ella was, Baker was really able to tap into in particular? Well, I think both the NAACP leadership and the leadership of King's organization, and I'll just refer to it as King's organization, although it was a ministerial organization, um, they recognized there was so much energy behind what was happening. And these sit-ins spread so quickly. NAACP and SCLC worked much slower. After all, they were adults and adults don't work as quickly as college students. <laughs> and so, um, you know, they, I shouldn't say plotted along, but they planned very carefully, especially the NAACP. I mean, the NAACP, uh, the civil rights struggle for them was in the courtroom. In uh, the courtrooms locally, and the cases went on up to the Supreme Court. For SCLC King's organization, they were demonstrating. I mean, the Montgomery bus boycott was a demonstration. But here, the students had done something that was very, very spontaneous. And they didn't really know what to make of this. In fact, they were a little peeved with the students. And Roy Wilkins, who was head of the NAACP, I want to read you what he said about the students, because they just simply didn't know where these students had come from, how they were organizing, how this all got started so quickly. And he said, a little harshly, these students don't take orders from anybody. They don't consult anybody. They operate in a kind of vacuum. When the headlines are gone, the issues still have to be settled in court. <laughs> so he was not at all keen on what they were doing. And so the leaders, both King and Roy Wilkins felt this was kind of an undisciplined group of young people. And what they ended up doing was inviting them to come under the umbrella of their respective organizations come be a part of NAACP, come be a part of SCLC. And uh, Ella Baker said, well, you want to think about that. I think you might want to keep yourselves independent from those organizations. Baker at the time was working for SCLC. She had worked for uh, NAACP. She had been a branch uh, organizer and director where she went throughout the South uh, helping the branches of NAACP to raise money, to uh, raise uh, memberships. And so she knew those both organizations quite well. And she just felt that the students had a kind of energy that she did not want to see lost under uh, the leadership of the, either one of those organizations. So she encouraged them to form their own. And indeed, they did. So if you're just tuning in with us right now, this is History Lunch Break. My name is Glenn Perkins, and I'm talking with Dr. Lee Williams uh, about uh, civil rights leader Ella Baker. If you guys have any questions on the Zoom side, feel free to drop them into our Q&A, uh, and we will, I will pass them along to our esteemed guest. So Lee, you were just talking about... Um, you know, Ella Baker's leadership style. And I think we'll, you know, get into that a little bit more and sort of how, uh, how she worked with those students and really gave them a lot of space to do their, to do their own thing. But to, where did that leadership style come from? Tell us a little bit about Ella's early life um, and some of the things that sort of inspired her to that work of service that mm -hmm. she reached by 1960. Well, um, she grew up, uh, was born in Norfolk, 
Virginia, but at about the age of seven, her parents relocated to uh, Littleton, North Carolina, right on the Virginia, North Carolina border. The influences in her life, her mother certainly was a great influence, uh, as was um, were the people around her, especially the grandparents. And the grandparents had been enslaved. So Ella Baker came along, she was just the second generation past slavery. But she saw very strong role models, especially among the women. Her mother, her mother's circle at the Black Baptist Church that they attended, the missionary work that the women did. Um, there were also very high expectations of the, the three children in that family. Ella had an older brother, Curtis, and a younger sister, Margaret, who was called Maggie. The parents really uh, emphasized the importance of being able to write well, to be able to speak well. And uh, Ella's mother had been a school teacher. And uh, before the kids went off to school, she prided herself on having taught them things like their ABCs, how to read, how to speak. So that was always emphasized. And I would imagine having myself grown up in the Black Baptist Church as a child, mm -hmm. that she had many opportunities to speak at programs in the church. And she just had a great deal of confidence in herself. She had confidence in herself, but she also had confidence in the people she worked with. So whenever Ella Baker had a program, and one of the first programs that she ran was at the Harlem branch of the New York City Public Library. It was a youth program. She would collaborate with other programs. She would reach out to people who were prominent in the community and bring them in to talk with the youth. She introduced them to books and to cultural activities. She was always one to bring in other people she always felt that groups should be run in a very democratic way and that all voices should be heard. And that meant that young people's voices were to be heard when they were interacting in adult uh, uh, audiences and organizations. She also felt that women's voices needed to be lifted up. And I'll give you one example. Um, she was the first uh, national director in 1930 for this Young Negroes Cooperative League that was started in New York, right? It, as the <laughs> depression was, uh, you know, uh, right at the beginning of that. Mm -hmm. And they saw that uh, people were hungry and starving and all the poverty around them. So they started this uh, league and, um, they, as most co-ops do, they sold shares and people could buy shares. They had to, in return, do some work uh, in the cooperative. But it didn't matter if a person had purchased 10 shares or another person one share. They only had one vote so that people's voices were equal. And she made sure in a meeting that everyone was heard. And that started in 1930. Now, Ella was two years out of college when she had that job. So you begin to see a pattern that would be replicated throughout her career, that she made sure that everyone was heard. And she wanted to make sure that these students were going to be heard and on their own. I think that's an interesting um place from which she started and which, you know, from where her organizing kind of grew, having that foundation of really trying to make sure that the other people's voices were at the forefront. So maybe she wasn't always the keynote speaker, right, at a, at a meeting or the loudest voice in the room, but letting others really make their mark, whether they were students or anybody else. He did. And that's one thing that, um, uh she was concerned about with the leadership, especially uh, of the SCLC. She felt that the idea of having national leaders we, and, and that to have them be as prominent as they were was in some ways a disservice to the movement. 
and she often criticized the leaders, including Dr. King, for that. She felt that the communities in which the NAACP was working or the SCLC was working, they're grassroots leaders. Mm -hmm. And let's hear from them. Let's not go in and impose the program that NAACP has their model on that community. Let's hear from people. And that really disturbed some of her colleagues at NAACP. They felt she was going in uh, to uh, settings that were unladylike and un NAACP like. I mean, mm -hmm. the NAACP would meet in churches. Well, Ella Baker went to barber shops. Ella Baker went to uh, pool rooms. Ella Baker went to bars. <laughs> <laughs> wherever there were people, and she identified the people who were respected in those settings. And then she felt that training and development uh, was really an important component of any program. And so you could take the beauty shop operator or the barber, and you could train them in how to run a meeting. But you could get people in the room because those folks were respected in their mm -hmm. community. And so that's the way she, she worked. Um, and she was very successful at it. In fact, one um, branch director from Richmond called uh, Walter White, who was head of the NAACP at the time before uh, Roy Wilkins and said, we need some help. And so White assigned Ella Baker to go to Richmond to help. Well, he let the branch uh, president in Richmond know that Ella Baker was on her way there. And the branch president said, well, I, I don't know that we want a woman. I'm not sure of the accommodations we can make available for her. I think a male would be much better at this. And um, White said, I'm sorry, she's on her way. And she got there, she spent some time and the letter he wrote back at the end of Ella Baker's uh, stay with them, lauded her. The membership had increased. She had raised money. He praised her to the hilt because she did such a fantastic job. And that's just one example of her organizing abilities and how she was able to change people's minds. Some men who were very set in their ways. There was lots of sexism throughout those organizations, but she knew what she was doing and she gained the respect of people in doing it. Um, I think, um, you know, despite all that success though, it's, she's not sort of held up, right? As one of the core leaders. civil rights leaders that we think of, you know, if, if, we, if we count off, you know, the people that we know about or celebrate or even, you know, teach our middle school students about. And exactly. And it's only, I, I said, when you asked me to give you a title, I said Ella Baker, six decades in the making, because it really has taken that long for her name to be mentioned. And it's mentioned so much now. I mean, Biden in his uh, acceptance speech at the Democratic uh, Convention started with a quote from Ella Baker. Uh, El at uh, John Lewis's funeral, they raised the name of Ella Baker. So Ella Baker now is getting that recognition that she didn't have uh, before. And John Lewis thought the world of Ella Baker. I mean, he said, um, <laughs> when he was a student, because he was in SNCC, he was the, mm -hmm. I think the third president. But he said, she was much older in terms of age, but I think in terms of ideas and philosophy and commitment, she was one of the youngest persons in the room. Eleanor Holmes, who is now Eleanor Holmes Norton, uh, she volunteered uh, at SNCC uh, right after graduating from Yale Law School. And she praised Baker as a doer and not just as a talker. I mean, these were people who had enormous respect for her. Uh, so I think in particular for uh, her name to be raised up at John Lewis's funeral was particularly meaningful.
Yeah, getting some of that due that she has deserved for a long time. For a long time. Jacqueline is asking a little bit about how you get got interested in Ella Baker, which I think also ties into this bigger question of women's roles in civil rights, right? Yes. Well, uh, until uh, when, when did I start this? I guess it was 2009. I decided that I would do a revised uh, edition of the first book I wrote, which is Servants of the People, the 1960s Legacy of African-American Leadership. In the first book, which came out in 1996, I profiled six leaders who were prominent, only one of whom was a woman, hmm. Fannie Lou Hamer. And that was because I used secondary sources, biographies, and I couldn't find anything on anyone else but uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. Well, fast forward to 2008, uh, much more scholarship was available, and there was a, a biography on um, Ella Baker, and it was just absolutely wonderful by uh, Barbara Ransby. And also Septima Clark, uh, who uh, organized citizenship schools and taught them throughout the South for SCLC. So I included those two women uh, in the second edition of Servants of the People. And one of the things that I had said way back in 1995 when I started doing the initial research for the first book was that it, I wanted at some point to make sure a younger generation of students knew about these leaders. And uh, I was just so pleased when I got the opportunity to uh, write the Baker biography as part of the uh, True Tales, for young readers mm -hmm. of the uh, North Carolina Office of Archives and History. Um, it was just a joy to, to bring Ella Baker forward as uh, one of the civil rights leaders and for this audience of juvenile, you know, youth, young people and, and juvenile readers. Uh, so I learned a lot. I mean, the name Ella Baker was somewhere in the back of my head. I associated it with this NCC with SNCC, but I didn't know as much about her as I later came to know. And obviously making that book for younger readers so appropriate to um, a leader like Ella Baker, who spent so much time reaching out and developing that, yeah. that younger cohort of Absolutely. civil rights workers, right? Absolutely. Teresa wants to know um, a little bit more about Ella's uh, involvement in, in New York City public schools around school inequality in the 1950s. Did you get into that in some uh, of your research? Hello, Teresa Canada. These are my New York people, <laughs> <laughs> uh, friend from New York. Um, I heard her name and then I forgot your question. Glenn, tell me again <laughs> what it is. Um, what was Ella, Ella Baker's involvement in, the, in New York City public schools around school inequality in the 1950s? Oh, well, let me tell you, in the 1950s, by that time, she was president of the New York City NAACP mm -hmm. chapter. And she, the first thing she did was to move the office from downtown New York City uptown to Harlem. Okay, that was a symbolic move. And then she looked at issues like school. Um, uh, she was concerned about the New York City school system and what was going on in that system. And uh, Teresa has actually written about that, so she would know it more in details. But yeah, that was one of the issues that Ella Baker had on the NAACP agenda to look at that whole issue around uh, school integration and, and that's or, or the issues that were around that uh, that particular subject because she felt again that she wanted to engage in issues that were of concern to the people in the community so um and you know to bring it in close to closer to sort of our our what we've seen recently in the in the protests of the last year or so again um driven by young, younger uh, people. Um, Carolyn Flowers wants to know what Ella Baker might have thought of um, the current Black Lives Matter campaigns mm -hmm. and other protests like that. She would have, I think, without a doubt supported it because who leads that? 
it's been young people. And she always believed that young people should have a voice. So I think she would be very supportive of that movement. She would have uh, applauded it. Um, she would have been very, very supportive and in favor of Black Lives Matter. Mm. And Sheila's asking about Ella Baker speaking at Bennett College. Yes, she did speak. Now, I don't remember exactly when, but she she spoke there. And um, Sheila is the person who designed the cover for my book mm -hmm. <laughs> that's behind me at the North Carolina Office of Archives and History and has been just wonderful, wonderful in promoting this book. So hello, Sheila. Um, but she did... Uh, she did come to to um, to Greensboro. She did speak at Bennett, as did Dr. Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. and and others. Uh, and Bennett was very open to having people who were seen as controversial, because uh, King, in fact, had tried to, or the community wanted King to come and speak, but the churches were reluctant to have him. <laughs> mm. And Willa Player, the president of Bennett College, said he can come and speak here. So um, they, you know, the Bennett opened up that wonderful Annie Pfeiffer Chapel to speakers and welcomed them. Eleanor Roosevelt was another one who came and, and spoke uh, in that uh, chapel. I know it would be amazing to get a list of everybody that, you know, Dr. Player in particular brought in to or broaden broaden our community and connect Greensboro to this you know that the the, the big civil rights movements that were happening. Well, I'm going to hold up these two volumes for you because what I did you can see this one and this one. Um, where can I get that? <laughs> I, Tricky I with actually, the zoom. I actually compiled two volumes of the speakers what? and their speeches when I was working at Bennett. And uh, Martin Luther King and C. Eric Lincoln was in one volume. And um, because they are in the archives, they are at Bennett. And Eleanor Roosevelt, Benjamin Mays, who was president of uh, Morehouse College, John Hope Franklin, uh, their speeches are in these two volumes. <laughs> What's the title of the volume? What are, what's the title well, of it? Well, and you can't find this probably anywhere except at Bennett, but it's the Bennett College Social Justice Lecture Series, Volume One and Volume Two. We'll have to work, find out if we can, if the Greensboro Public Library has those available. You will, beca as because well. only one volume, uh, the funding for the publication was from the North Carolina Humanities Council. and. The other, it was from, again, the, the council gave us some funding and the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation. Oh. <laughs> That's a wonderful resource that we need to make available. Um, we're running close to the end of our time. I did want to ask a couple more questions sort of uh, from the chat about, or from the Q&A about um, Ella's involvement and her, did and, and um, did she specifically work to develop women, other women leaders within oh, SNCC yes. and, and other groups? She did because the women, as we said, their, their roles were not very prominent. Um, Joanne Grant, who was a reporter who wrote a book about Ella and produced an award-winning film, Fundy, the story of Ella Baker, and you can find it on YouTube. Fundi, F-U-N-D-I, is a Swahili word, which means a person who passes skills from one generation to the next. Joanne Grant, a Caucasian woman reporter, mm -hmm. uh, was very close to Ella. Diane Nash, now that name is known, and I know she came a few years ago to speak at the February 1 breakfast on the campus of A&T. She was a Fisk student from Chicago. She was a founding member of SNCC and was one of the few women, uh, young women who rose to prominence in the organization. Uh, so those are certainly two women who were, were prominent among the, the men who were involved in SNCC. And Marion wants to know what other women you think should be held up as leaders of the civil rights movement as we continue to recognize and acknowledge their work. I 
would say, um, and she's in my book had a profile, but Septa McClark. Mm-hmm. Septa McClark lost her job teaching in South Carolina because she was a member of the NAACP. And the state of South Carolina outlawed the NAACP membership. If you were found to be a member, you could lose your job teaching at that time. And uh, Septima Clark was very proud of the fact. In fact, she probably held an office in the branch chapter and she lost her job. It took her 20 years to get her pension from the fund. But she's one as well uh, who deserves probably uh, more attention. There's so many stories. Uh, I feel like we could just keep talking all day, but sadly we have run out of time. Um, it's been um, just so good to talk to you and to share all of your knowledge about Ella Baker. Um, I'm excited that our North Carolina Democracy um, Initiative and developing exhibit uh, for the fall here at the Greensboro History Museum is certainly going to look at her role, the role of women's, um, again, uh, often unacknowledged women's roles in building democracy in different ways across our state. So we're looking forward to continuing our conversation with you, Lee, re- re- relying on your wisdom and knowledge to help us develop those things. Uh, so thank you again for spending a little time with us today at lunch. Well, thank you for inviting me and thanks to all the circle of friends uh, here in Greensboro, as well as people in um, New York, Milwaukee <laughs> and other places who joined in. Thanks so much, I appreciate it. Yes, thanks all to all of you who've tuned in. It's been a, a great program. Um, I can tell you the History Lunch Break will be back next week. Uh, John Zachman is going to share a recent interview he did with David Sheets, who's the, special, who's the father of Special Olympian and North Carolina Athletic Hall of Famer, Marty Sheets. You know, it's also March is Women's History Month. It's also Developmental Disability Awareness Month. Uh, so he's going to be talking with Jacqueline Hawkins as well, who's the exceptional children parent liaison at Guilford County Schools about special education in our local schools today. Our uh, shows are all archived. If you want to catch up on previous History Lunch Break episodes, you can have a History Lunch Break any day of the week. Uh, You can check out our last week's conversation with Rebecca Barefoot from Guilford Courthouse National Military Park. That's all on our YouTube channel uh, at youtube.com slash Greensboro History Museum. And I need to mention the Greensboro History Museum's online programs are made possible by our nonprofit, GHM Inc. And your membership supports collections, care, and exhibitions, and education programs, and online stuff like we're doing right here. Uh, So if you want to become a member of GHM Inc. and support what we're up to, we certainly welcome that. You can go to our website, greensborohistory.org, to learn more. And while you're there, you can follow our social media accounts and subscribe to our e-news and find out and check out our Pieces of Now uh, virtual exhibition. There's so much to do. Uh, in the meantime, we'll look forward to seeing you next week on History Lunch Break. Thank you again to our guest, Lee, and we'll see you again soon. Mm-hmm.